Well, good morning, um, good afternoon, or good evening, uh, depending on uh, where you are joining us from. Uh, thank you for joining us. Welcome to our seventh educational webinar of the Climate Course for Global Gastroenterology that's sponsored by the World Gastroenterology uh, Organization. Uh, my name is uh, Bishop Omari. I'm a gastroenterologist now working at Rutgers University uh, in the United States, involved mainly in research and administration. I've had the privilege uh, to serve uh, as a member of a WGO steering committee that helped put this course uh, together under the leadership of uh, Professor Des Levin. Uh, I also would like to take this opportunity. It just happens, turns out that uh, uh, this uh, just as of two days ago, uh, congratulations are in order to WGO that are celebrating their 65th uh, birthday. Today, I have the uh, pleasure to uh, briefly introduce our distinguished group of uh, co-moderators and speakers. Um, our uh, moderator, uh, who's uh, with us uh, today, able to join is uh, uh, Dr. Roque Sanz. He's affiliated with the Clinica Al Alimana de Santiago in uh, Chile. Uh, he is a former president of the Chilean Gastroenterology Society and past president of the Chilean Association of Digestive uh, Endoscopy. Uh, and uh, also I should mention that uh, uh, Dr. Sanz is a member of WGO's Climate Change Working Group that very recently uh, became elevated to a permanent uh, role as the WGO committee, which is uh, very uh, exciting. Um, our second moderator, Dr. Riza Malikzadeh, uh, may not be able to join us. So if he joins, I will, it will be my pleasure uh, to introduce him. So today we have two fantastic presentations. Um, I will introduce uh, both speakers, both presentations, then we'll uh, follow one after the other. Uh, and then we'll open up the session. We'll have about 20 minutes uh, or so for questions and answers. And this is really uh, an important part of, of, uh, of uh, all these uh, webinars. And there's been a lot of dialogue and exchange um, and fantastic questions. Uh, so please uh, don't be shy with your questions. And the way to uh, input your questions is in the chat. If you click on the chat and just uh, type in your question, uh, our moderator uh, and myself uh, will be able uh, to see it. And uh, uh, some of you might end up putting them in a Q and A. We'll be able to see both, but if you can, uh, if you have, a, uh, if you can see the chat, go ahead, please put them in the chat. So I'll introduce uh, now both uh, distinguished speakers. First is Dr. Lee Donnelly. She is a, a simply an amazing nurse, uh, endoscopy training and development lead with Northumbria Health uh, Care Foundation Trust in the UK. Uh, she's also an endoscopy sustainability lead. Uh, she's involved with the British Society of Gastroenterology Nurses Association as a deputy chair. She's also counselor, green endoscopy champion, and working group member of the European Society of Gastroenterology and Endoscopy Nurses uh, and Associates. Our second distinguished speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Uh, Todd uh, Sack. He is a Florida US-based uh, gastroenterologist uh, who uh, speaks and writes extensively about climate change, health, and how health professionals can get involved. And you're gonna actually see uh, a fair bit more about uh, his involvement uh, during uh, his presentation. So uh, in the interest uh, of time, let's get the show going. So Jim, we can, if we could please uh, start with um, uh, Dr. Donnelly's uh, presentation. Hello, my name is Lee Donnelly. I'm Education and Development Lead in Endoscopy Services for Northumbria Healthcare Foundation Trust in the UK. And I'm delighted to have been invited today by the WGO to discuss the nursing perspectives of the climate crisis as part of their fantastic webinar series on the climate course for global gastroenterology. I have no declarations. However, I'm affiliated as deputy chair of the BSGNA, committee member for SGNA, consultant editor of Gastrointestinal Nursing Journal, and I'm a member of various working parties and scientific committees. The aim of the session today is to discuss the nursing perception of sustainability in healthcare, how to implement green changes in the working environment, but also some practical implementation of a greener endoscopy. And I will be doing this through the patient journey of pre-procedure, peri-procedure and post-procedure. Nurses are very aware of the climate change and how this affects healthcare. However, there are challenges related to nursing practice. The nursing profession is very keen to have a positive impact on climate change, and they would like to implement strategies within their working environment. Nurses are very much at the forefront working at grassroots level, 
and are pivotal putting these changes to make their environments greener in action. However, we do know through the literature that there is a lack of knowledge and education regarding climate change, sustainable work and practices. And this is often a barrier to nurses because of the difficult language that's in use. Some of the other barriers include that the healthcare systems don't lend themselves to sustainable solutions. And there are also challenges working with different departments, such as infection control teams or business management. There's often an inability for nurses to implement their own ideas, and there are barriers with hierarchical approach in nursing still. There is also difficulty in understanding that a lot of the products we use have poor green credentials and we are uncertain as a profession where to go with this and how to challenge industry. What is important to nurses in their sustainability journey? Well, it always revolves around patient care and how sustainable healthcare impacts on that care delivery. Nurses often ask, Will being more sustainable be detrimental to patient care needs? And will moving from disposable to reusable devices or reducing glove use be detrimental? We also need to consider how being more sustainable will impact on current workloads, as nursing is very much understaffed at the moment and morale is very low. Nurses often ask the question, if they recycle at source, how do we know that the organisation is disposing of waste streams correctly? And also, we can't underestimate the impact of coronavirus and continued use of PPE. In some areas, legislation is still in place that mandates this. We need to consider whether this is still appropriate. On reviewing the literature, there are very little information regarding greener practices and nursing care. So much more education needs to be implemented and we need to add to the academic arena regarding nursing implementation of greener endoscopy and other areas. There are also time constraints which nurses are concerned this will impact on their ability to be more sustainable in their work and practices. So what is our goal as nurses? Well, first of all, we need to ask, what can we do today to make our working area more sustainable? We also need to follow the mantra of refuse, reuse, reduce, repurpose and recycle. We need to use resources appropriately and make conscious decisions. We also need to gain support from management, which can be often really difficult when there's cost implications. And we also need to include patients in our goals and decision making. So where to start? For me, start the discussion tomorrow. There is no delay. We need to start motivating members immediately and introduce them to aspects of the work that they can take on board. We need to create open networks with other units and share ideas. And this could be liaising with infection control, pathology units, but also units outside the organisation who have also implemented greener, successful working environments. We need to look for those quick wins or the low hanging fruit or the easy options, the things that can be done quite easily without any resources. It's also important that we discuss what we want to implement with waste management services within the departments, as this might help with the decision making of what to start with first. And communication is key. It is vital that we communicate along with our management, other team members and working with other specialities. Implementing your sustainability journey means change. And that means difficulties for lots of people within the team, we have to consider that human element and that is something that I didn't when I started my sustainability journey. And I would like to share some of those things that I have learned that may make your journey easier. Be prepared for difficult discussions. It is quite difficult in order to get people to be embraced. Not everyone is enthusiastic as you. What we're trying to create is a change in behaviour which means creating a culture of change. And acceptance is really the hardest part of change. 
I learned that motivating the team to share a common goal was really important, but that took a lot of time. One of the things was we needed to openly discuss barriers and challenges, and we needed to make sure that the whole environment was set up in order to achieve this. But also a constant reinforcement of what our goals were, were really important. I did this through having a sustainability promise or having posters up just to remind people, but also the green champions, which we'll talk about a little bit later on, were key in this constant reinforcement. But nursing teams need to see evidence of their success. So therefore you need to make sure that you audit your progress and demonstrate this. Share with your patients and your team members and other members what actual achievements you have been made. This may be through social media, um, organisation newsletters, or simply just posters. In the next few slides, we will go through some of the practical implementation of making your department more sustainable. In this slide, I will share a few organisational and environmental changes can be made, which are very simple. For me, I am very much in favour of green champions on each unit, and the success of my green journey is really down to these people. They are very motivated and very enthusiastic, and share that enthusiasm with the rest of the team members. They are there as a resource, and they often remind people of what needs to be done on the department. And I think that is very important because what that does is that just keeps the motivation going and keeps our goal at the forefront of everyone's minds. I also feel that your sustainability journey should be discussed at the huddle and the team brief or the nursing handover every day, because that again just reminds people, what are we going to do today to be more sustainable? I believe a development of a key sustainability MDT group is key. This also flattens the hierarchy and opens those channels of communication throughout of the whole team. And this is really important, particularly when all members of the team need to be involved in this journey. As I've already mentioned, there is very little in the academic arena regarding nursing and sustainability. So therefore we need to try and educate staff about sustainability in endoscopy and other GI departments. And I believe that sustainability needs to be a standing item on governance meetings such as the endoscopy user group or other management meetings. And then the whole team can be informed and progress can be minuted. We'll move on now and start discussing a little bit about the practical implementation of a greener endoscopy unit. Endoscopy produces a huge amount of paper, so a quick win would be to make sure that all paper is printed double-sided as standard. We need to think about offering patients refreshments in reusable cups rather than plastic or wax paper. We need to consider producing a sustainability report for new endoscopy accessories and devices, and this helps us make a conscious decision. And probably one of the most important things I had realised was don't underestimate the impact of room layout, particularly that this has on waste segregation and things like bin placement became a very important issue. Our green journey should start pre-procedure. We need to make sure that we are offering the most appropriate procedures to all patients. Therefore, all endoscopic procedures need to be triaged in line with current guidelines and where appropriate alternative procedures offered. We may need to consider implementing frailty scores to ensure that patients are appropriately investigated. And we need to offer additional investigations to be formed on the same day as endoscopy procedures, such as scanning where appropriate and blood testing. Telephone pre-assessment clinics need to be established to reduce the miles travelled by patients and we'll also need to have digital format patient information available, but also still have paper copies for those patients who don't have access to digital equipment. Moving through the next stage of the patient journey into the procedure room. We need to do a few things in here which will help and are often quick wins. We need to audit the use of endoscopy accessories. 
we need to make sure that all of our scopes are reusable and that we use reusable valves with the exception of biopsy valves, which must be single use as standard. And we need to make sure that we have effective segregation of our waste streams into clinical recycling and domestic. And as I mentioned earlier on, the position of the bins is particularly important in the procedure rooms. Visual prompts are really important to help encourage staff to segregate waste appropriately. And this is an example of a poster which can be placed in the treatment rooms, which offers some advice about where things need to be segregated. Moving on to the post procedure phase of the patient journey. These things can be quite simple and we can find some quick wins here. We need to think about how we disseminate our reports. Can we offer electronic reporting to reduce the amount of paper printed? We need to think about offering digital post procedure information leaflets. We can do that via QR code on discharge, but also we need to make sure that we keep some printed copies for patients who need them. We need to think about reporting electronically to GPs and other referring clinicians, and we need to continue with our telephone or virtual post endoscopy follow ups. Patient information and feedback is a vital part of managing our service, so we need to make sure we collect this digitally as well, again via QR codes or iP iPads. We've talked about sharing our ideas visually and having feedback, not only for patients, but also for our staff on our green journey. This is just an example of a poster we had produced for our endoscopy unit, which just lets patients know what we've achieved so far. But it also informs the teams as well and helps to keep that motivation going. We've seen what practical measures can be taken in order to establish a greener endoscopy unit. But sometimes there are more difficult questions that need to be asked. In the next few slides, I'll run through some of these. We know that appropriate patient selection and reduction in the amount of endoscopy could have the largest impact on carbon emissions. And we've seen that through the evidence provided in previous webinars. So some more questions that we need to ask. Can surveillance procedures need to be reduced? Are there alternative investigations that can be utilised? Do we overuse procedures? Can we source reduced waste packaging? And can we digitalise all our documentation? And I'm stealing um, this phrase from um, Boo Hai, who says the most wasteful procedure is the one that doesn't need to be done. And that's absolutely true. But we also need to look at better training and education. And we need to inform people about sustainability. We need to make sure that we follow the evidence and guidelines appropriately. And we'll probably need to implement stricter triaging. We need to have clear conversations with patients regarding expectations. And in the UK, we probably need to review our direct to test procedures. We also need to aim for reduction in repeated procedures, for example, within our adequate bowel prep or where instructions were not followed by providing with better instructions and perhaps videos, etc. A few things to think about in the future. We need to liaise and network with our pathology colleagues to see if we can reduce the amount of histology pots used. Three biopsy pots is the equivalent of two miles travelled, and I believe that would be quite a quick win. We need to challenge industry and supply chains with regard to packaging, single use items, logistics, and we need to challenge their green credentials, which will also help us make conscious decisions. We need industry to look, look at their equipment and their washing machines and processing, and each washing cycle uses about 90 to 100 litres of water. Hopefully in the future, this will become much less. And I think quite crucially, we need further research pertaining to gastroenterology, hepatology and endoscopy. Just a few take home messages really. And we all can do something that will make our working environments much more sustainable. And I think it's time we all did something about this. 
just ask, what can we do to be more sustainable? Even the smallest amount of changes have the big impact. Even starting the discussion with your colleagues is really important. Remember, appropriate patient selection and reduction in the amount of endoscopy will have a huge impact. And the most wasteful procedure is the one that doesn't need to be done. Maintain motivation within your teams by having that whole team approach, and that is particularly important. This is my reference list. Thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Donnelly. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Todd Sack. Uh, looking forward to your presentation, uh, Todd. Uh, Jim, I think we can um, start the presentation. Hello, my name is Todd Sack, and I'm delighted to share with you ideas about how we health professionals can be advocates for climate change mitigation. I want to thank the World Gastroenterology Organization leadership and its 117 member societies for this timely and important eight-part symposium. I am pleased to share this session with Leigh Donnelly. I particularly want to thank Dr. Rochelle Omari and at Rutgers and Dr. Desmond Layden at Dalhousie for inviting me. And I want to thank today's moderators as well. Uh, you've already heard in the last several symposia much information about the influence of climate change upon health and the roles of gastroenterologists. Today, I'm going to not repeat that information, but instead draw on it to give you some very practical ideas for how you can add climate change mitigation to your practice, to your life, and to your community. Please grab a piece of paper and a pencil and be ready to see how you can commit to some aspects of this work. I'm a gastroenterologist in Jacksonville, Florida, USA, and in Karatu, Tanzania. I'm associate clinical professor at the Wertheim College of Medicine in Miami, where my research is on how best to teach our patients and our fellow health professionals about climate change and the health risks. I've chaired the environment and health section of my Florida Medical Association. I've been a delegate to the American Medical Association, where I've helped many societies adopt sound policies on climate change and environmental health, including topics such as adding climate change to our curricula and education programs, fossil fuel divestment, the responsibilities of physicians, and other topics. And I give community talks for Rotary Clubs, congregations, and government agencies on the importance of climate change and health. I'm president of Physicians for Social Responsibility and executive director of the My Green Doctor Foundation. <clears throat> I have no personal financial interests in relation to this presentation, though I may mention briefly the biodegradable BioNight gloves, which is a corporate sponsor of the My Green Doctor Foundation. <clears throat> PSR is a US-based nonprofit since 1961. You can access it at PSR.org. Uh, PSR shared in the Nobel Peace Prizes in 1985 and 2017. We are health professionals in 20 state chapters addressing the existential threats to mankind, nuclear war, climate change, and environmental toxics. And I mentioned PSR because we're recruiting now our next executive director, so please email me if you might be interested or would like to share the job description with a colleague you admire. <clears throat> now, I'm not going to talk about climate change science or its health impacts in detail, but I'd like you to always keep in mind the elephant in the room of climate change and the imperative that mankind abandon fossil fuels for energy generation and transportation uh, in the next few decades. This is my hometown of Jacksonville, Florida, after a minor hurricane. And you can imagine the terrible economic and emotional and potentially health devastation of effects of climate change such as this. <clears throat> I'd like you to consider talking about the co-benefits of climate change action, because addressing climate change also means better health. As we use less fossil fuel, there's less asthma, COPD, heart disease, and cancer. It means prosperity with better jobs, economic stability, and lowered health costs. There's going to be improvement to nature as we have cleaner air, water, and land. Stability to our communities with fewer disasters, less national and international migration. And the opportunity for equity and justice as we reduce health care and other economic disparities. <clears throat> My goals for today's program, though, 
are first to explain why climate change is important to gastroenterologists and to all health professionals, to offer ways you can make climate change advocacy part of your life and to help get your gastroenterology practice started today. <clears throat> So why is climate change important to gastroenterologists and all health professionals? Where are, well, our healthcare industry is responsible for 4.4% of the world's toxic air pollutants and greenhouse gases because we require energy and other materials, all of which lead to the burning of fossil fuels, air pollutants, and greenhouse gases. Now, in the United States, our healthcare system is responsible for 27% of global healthcare emissions and 8.5% of all U.S. greenhouse gases. And the air pollution from the U.S. healthcare industry leads to 405,000 years of lost life annually through the diseases as a result of burning fossil fuels. And our clinics and offices, our outpatient practices are important as well. Outpatient care is responsible in the U.S. for about 26% of healthcare's greenhouse gases. And I'm sure there's a similarly high number around the world. There are millions of healthcare offices and practices worldwide. I believe there are huge opportunities for us to save resources and money. We can influence the choices made by our patients as they see us as an example, as a role model, but also as we provide them with sound information for how to improve their own lives and how to protect themselves and their families from the health threats of climate change. And finally, we have the unique ability to reach climate vulnerable communities through the patients we see in, in our offices. So where can we be advocates for climate change mitigation? I'm gonna go through each of these in the next 10 minutes. In our personal lives, in our community organizations, in our governments, in our medical schools, in our prevention societies, our hospitals, and in our outpatient practices. <clears throat> so, in our personal lives, we can save energy by how we adjust our thermostats, by choosing the right light bulbs, for always using the Energy Star appliances. These are the appliances rated by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, but there are similar ratings in Europe, South America, and other continents. By using renewable energy in the United States, the 2022 Inflation Reduction Act is an excellent opportunity to put solar panels on your home or business practically for free. And so you should really consider that in, in 2023 for your home or business. By reusing, by recycling, by avoiding whenever possible the use of plastics for the products we buy. By using chemical wisely. In the United States, we have the US EPA Safer Choice List, which lists more than 500 cleaning products uh, and other chemicals for the home or business. You should buy nothing that isn't on the safer choice list because these are products that are safer in the manufacturing, safer for the workers, and safer in your own home or business. By choosing healthy foods, choosing a plant-based diet, and avoiding meat from four-legged animals. By choosing electric vehicles, we should never buy a gas-powered car anymore. The electric cars are a great deal financially, and they're a lot of fun. By using public transportation, biking, and walking. By divestment of, from fossil fuel investments in our personal investments and those of the organizations we love. And finally, by participating, by attending public meetings on environmental sustainability, resilience, and by always voting with climate change in mind. How about our community organizations? What do I mean by community organizations? Well, these are houses of worship, our civic groups such as Rotary Club and similar public organizations, in our gyms and sports teams, in our recreational clubs, in the schools that we or our children or our grandchildren attend, in our neighborhood associations, and in our political parties. So what sort of activities should you look at? Well, all of these organizations should have policy statements on resilience, on environmental quality, on going net zero. Uh, they should have a sustainability committee. And if they don't, go ahead and organize one. And if there is one, join it. You'll be very pleased if you do. They should have policies on using energy wisely by avoiding plastics, recycling, reusing, wherever po reusing products wherever possible. Their buildings should be managed sustainability. Their purchases should be the best uh, that they can find using recycled paper, for example. Uh, the food choices offered in public meetings should be plant-based wherever possible, and there should be a vegetarian option. And finally, uh, we should share ideas with lecturers and, and 
for our colleagues and friends in these organizations and in our, in our science curricula in our schools. <clears throat> and we should be advocates in our professional societies. And I'm so excited by the work <clears throat> of many from the WGO and others. Uh, the, these are the, the headings of two important papers in 2022 that have been referenced already in the symposia. Uh, there was a survey of global gastroenterology society leadership, which demonstrated that our leaders are interested in climate change and are rolling up their sleeves, uh, admitting that it is something that our societies need to engage in. And now there is a GI multi-society strategic plan on environmental sustainability, uh, now, the importance of this is that these are only plans, these are only proposals. It's going to require the push by our members, by people like you, to ensure that uh, these po po policies are implemented, that we develop the programs needed. Um, let me give an example from our, a summary of our GI Society strategic plan. It, it, it talks about the, the clinical setting, devising and fostering sustainable clinical practices to reduce waste, education to raise awareness among our members and to teach our patients, research on, to raise money for research on the intersection of environment, climate change, and digestive health. For our societies themselves to achieve sustainable policies across all their missions, uh, and to work with industry to engage to develop products both pharmaceutical and machinery uh, that meet the highest standards of environmental sustainability. And finally, that our societies, that our leaders become advocates of first policies within government. So how can you be engaged in your professional society? First, be informed. Take CME, continuing medical education courses such as this one. Read those articles in the medical journals as the literature evolves to help guide us and our profession uh, towards sustainability and climate change mitigation. Join your society's climate change working group. You'll meet some really exciting people. Uh, you'll learn a lot and you'll have fun. Help your societies create sound policies and programs on topics like climate change as a health program, our professional responsibilities, directing research priorities, developing best practices in digestive health disease care, curricula for medical schools, for residencies, for our fellowships, education for health professionals and patients, fossil fuel divestment by our institutions and by our own investment portfolios, working with industry on sustainability, providing practice management resources for our clinics and offices, and for our societies themselves to help our leaders, to help people like you and me to become advocates on climate change and health in government. Okay, we've talked about many of the topics. Now let's talk about the last two, how we can become advocates for climate change in our hospitals and in our practices. Well, for hospitals, there are great resources. I'm gonna name two of them. I love Healthcare Without Harm. Their website is noharm.org. Their Practice Green Health and Healthier Hospital Initiatives. Also the American Hospital Association has a sustainability roadmap. Uh, and there are many resources for hospitals and big medical centers uh, from on every continent of the world with topics, with guidelines, with practice ideas for energy conservation, including adopting or creating renewable energy, waste management, including recycling programs, greening the hospital supply chain, managing climate warming and anesthetic gases, employee transportation options, healthy foods, and hospitals, medical systems as climate advocates. I urge you, if particularly if you're hospital-based and don't work primarily in a clinic or office or outpatient practice, to join your hospitals or your department's environmental sustainability committee. And by the way, if there isn't one, ask your department chair to start one, but join that committee. You're gonna meet some remarkably interesting people and be really excited by the projects that you embark on to help your hospital, your medical center to go green. The last couple of minutes I'm gonna spend talking about outpatient practices and get out that pen and paper because I'm gonna offer you a, a money saving offer to get your practice started immediately. So what are the benefits to our practice going green? We save money by lowering overhead costs, typically about $1,000 per practitioner per year. We decrease uses of energy, water, chemicals, and other resources. Going green improves office teamwork and staff morale. I think it provides a better office experience for patients and a better public relations profile for the practice. 
perhaps even increasing patient trust as patients come to see us as thinking more broadly than just uh, today's prescription. Uh, I think it creates a healthier office as we use chemicals and foods more wisely. We can encourage wise choices by our patients and our families, both by them seeing us as examples as they see what we're doing in our office, but also by providing education materials to our patients. And finally, the bottom line, we have the opportunity to contribute in this way as well to improving community health. So there are a few excellent resources for practice managers and professionals in the office. I'm a big fan of the Royal College of General Practitioners Greener Practice Program. It's called Green Impact for Health. It's kind of UK focused, but it's an absolutely excellent uh, uh, work based, workbook based project for uh, going step by step to green your outpatient practice. I love the American College of Physicians Climate Change Toolkit with lots of handouts and posters you can use in the office. And My Green Doctor, which is available at mygreendoctor.org and mygreendoctor.es in Spanish for our Spanish preferring colleagues and patients. I'm going to spend the last couple of minutes talking to you about My Green Doctor, which is the program I'm most familiar with. And we're going to get your practice started today. So what is My Green Doctor? This is a complete environmental sustainability practice management program. It's available online at those two websites, mygreendoctor.org and mygreendoctor.es. Uh, My Green Doctor has about 10,000 users per year from all over the world in 80 plus countries. And currently 29 organizations provide My Green Doctor to their members as a free membership practice management benefit. So if your organization isn't participating in My Green Doctor, ask them to participate and make this available to your members. It's free to the organization and free to the members. This is a comprehensive science-based program, non-political, and very easy to use, as you're going to see. It's available for any outpatient clinic, practice, office, or ambulatory surgical center. And as I said, most patients save money in the first month. These are the current 29 participating organizations, groups like the World Medical Association, the American Academy of Family Physicians, the American Academy of Dermatology, Medical Group Managers Association, and many, many more. And if you don't see your organization on the list, uh, contact me and, and we'll get uh, your organization on board. What makes it work and make, which makes it so easy is the meeting by meeting guide, which is a complete script for each clinic management meeting. Uh, using the meeting, meeting, meeting by meeting guide adds just five minutes to each business meeting agenda. So if your clinic or your office meets once a month to talk about uh, business issues such as using the EHR or billing or scheduling or complaints or vacations or whatever, we ask you to commit to adding just five minutes of My Green Doctor business to that agenda. The meeting by meeting guide explains exactly what to do and to say at each meeting. So there's nothing for the office manager to study or prepare. She or he doesn't need to become a tree hugger or a sustainability manager, just follows the meeting by meeting guide and focuses on slow, steady improvements, making one or two decisions, one or two changes on for the practice each month. We foster patient and staff teaching. We encourage discussion and staff involvement. And it's such a pleasure to watch uh, the smiles on the faces of those in the practice participating in, in these meetings. And we provide a green team notes form for easy record keeping. These are some of the topics uh, in the meeting by meeting guide, but I should tell you that when you register at My Green Doctor, you get a handsome pledge certificate there on the left, which we encourage you to uh, print and post in your lunch room, but also in the in the patient waiting room, because this is a way for you to, to brag a little bit and to tell your patients and your colleagues about the wonderful work you're doing. The topics though in the meeting by meeting guide include energy use, adjusting thermostats, using the correct lighting, turning off computers and machines when they're not needed, you embracing renewable, renewable energy, maybe putting on solar panels, or maybe purchasing renewable energy from your local utility. We talk a lot about products, you reusing, recycling, avoiding styrofoam, there should be no styrofoam in the building, choosing options like biodegradable gloves. I mentioned Bionight as one product or a pr printing ink that is made from soy instead of fossil fuels and the, for the same cost as the fossil fuel product, using less plastics and less waste, healthy food choices, using chemicals wisely, the cleaning products, the insecticides outdoors, uh, water conservation, transportation options for the staff, 
for the patients and patient education. Um, how about green teams? I see many offices uh, have a few people step aside as a green team and do a few projects. And I want to tell you that those are uniformly a bad idea. Uh, they work for a few weeks and then uh, the team falls apart. No, incorporate sustainability into the fiber of your organization by planning to uh, have a little bit of sustainability, a little bit of climate change advocacy as part of every meeting and participate with the whole clinic, the whole office in your practice manager meetings. Uh, we offer healthy home brochures for patients on lots of topics, climate change, how to protect your family, extracts, surviving extreme heat, air pollution, healthy eating, green cleaning, and many others. You can print these for your patients or simply give them the QR code and they can access these uh, at home. And completing our program, uh, you get a fancy uh, certificate, a recognition document to post proudly uh, in the office waiting room and in the lunchroom. A success story here is the Escambia County Health Department in Pensacola, Florida, that has used My Green Doctor. There are five offices in the Florida Panhandle. They've been saving money every month, about 5% of their electricity every year, which comes down to 120,000 kilowatt hours of electricity. 85,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide, and they've been saving about $14,000 annually. You can see on the lower right that one year they use their savings to help them buy solar panels for one of their buildings. Okay, last couple of slides. Uh, we're going to talk about how to get your practice started today. You begin by registering at migrantdoctor.org. Register as a partner society member. Use the discount code MGDWGO from the World Gastroenterology Organization. Uh, you'll save hundreds of dollars the first year and using My Green Doctor is free to you and everyone in your practice forever. So write down that discount code MGDWGO. Uh, you're gonna commit, you're gonna commit to adding five minutes of My Green Doctor to each practice manager meeting. So talk to your office manager or your clinic leader and ask them to make this simple commitment. Plan to make small steady improvements in your practice making a few changes every month that over the months will really add up. Provide your patients with brochures, posters, and other teaching tips in the waiting room, all available at mygreendoctor.org or .es. And finally, part of the commitment is to commit to qualifying for the Green Doctor Office Certificate, which you likely will be ready for in six to eight months. So we've talked about being advocates for climate change mitigation in our personal lives, in our community organizations, in our governments, in our medical schools, in our professional societies, in our hospitals, in our practices. And I hope you've written down a number of these and picked a few that you can commit to making part of your life. I know you'll be happier for it, and I know you can make a difference. I want to thank you for helping our colleagues to go green. Please remember that discount code MGDWGO as a way to get your clinic going green. And I want to thank again the leaders of the 117 professional societies of the World Gastrology Organization for this wonderful program. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Donnelly and Sack. Wonderful presentation, lots of specific uh, advice and, uh, and tips. Uh, so now we have about uh, 15 to 20 minutes uh, for a question and answer session, I would ask uh, the participants if any questions uh, for um, our two speakers. And I will first, maybe I have a few questions myself, but I will ask my friend uh, Roque to see if he has uh, any questions just to kick off the Q&A session. Okay, thank you to the organizers and also the speakers with the wonderful talks. And um, I would like to start the saying that uh, we have been spending a lot of time in the diagnosis and the urgency of these topics, but now is the time to actions. Uh, the time is uh, uh, almost over to diagnosis and just to go through actions. And uh, we need to involve patients as well in, in this uh, career. And um, I would like to insist in motivation of the, all the team members and uh, of course nurses 
is uh, crucial to tackle this point, especially in endoscopy. It's a challenge for endoscopy. I would like to ask uh, for the first question to Dr. Donnelly about the, the uh, champions in the unit of endoscopy. How do you choose them? Which are the attributions? And how that really works? And if you have any audit of their action? Thank you, Dr. Donnelly. Thank you very much. That's a, a really good question. Um, the Green Champions actually choose themselves. They're a really highly motivated group of individuals who are very passionate about um, the climate crisis and want to make an active difference. Um, so they actually they choose themselves and they often uh, want to be recognised as, as a Green Champion who are, um, are, are going to be there to motivate the other members of staff and things. We do have um, audits on their outcomes, which are specific to, um, for example, different initiatives that they've brought to the, the forefront. For example, we've moved away from um, sort of plastic bags for patient belongings and gone to a reusable baskets and things like that. And we've, we've had a patient satisfaction audit done on those sorts of things, which have been really popular. And for me, I, I really have a strong belief in, in those because they're at the forefront all of the time, every day, so they can con be constant with that motivation and enthusiasm. And then can also can see the little things that might need to change and the, the little things that, that become more apparent every day. And that also bring that conversation through the whole of the MDT. So not only through the nurses, but also through the doctors as well. So I think it's a, it's a great resource. And my advice would be to have a team of green champions would be, part of your, your starting process. I think that they're, they're brilliant. And probably we should all be champions. Oh, uh, absolutely. This task. Everyone should absolutely. be on board. And Everybody, I would like to... Everyone's on board, yeah, absolutely. Yes. I would like to ask uh, Professor Todd, there's a lot of uh, indication which are really interesting and uh, useful. Uh, you talk a little bit about avoiding uh, reducing unnecessary procedures. And in that sense, uh, we have the excess of biopsies. And uh, nowadays in endoscopy, the, in colonoscopy, which is my field, um, we try to reduce uh, just doing resect and discard or diagnose a lead. And uh, that has a lot of implications in in climate change about uh, expenses and, and uh, carbon footprint and so on and so forth. And uh, just uh, another uh, few words about uh, training congresses and research, which are very important uh, sources of uh, uh, carbon footprint. Thank you, Professor Dunn. Thank you. I think it's so important that our professional organizations, those members, states of the WGO, kind of roll their sleeves and create the kind of guidelines for training that talk about these topics. So let's have sustainability part of the curriculum in our medical schools and in our residencies and our fellowships so that our trainees are aware that the number of biopsies actually does make a difference and that adhering to practice guidelines so that we do our colonoscopies on the three to five year schedules follow up of adenomatous polyps and not on the one year as we sometimes see where I live in the United States. Um, so there's a great role for professional societies to come forward quickly with sustainability oriented guidelines so that we're always thinking about that. Okay, I would like also to ask you, you highlight the, the problem of heat. Uh, and that's uh, something that's coming very, very at the first line. The, the temperature in the world is uh, really increasing heavily. And we have, for instance, in Greece, the Ministry of, of Heat. And uh, last year, there was in Thessalonica, 47 degrees Celsius. And mm. in the Antarctic Territory this year, 16 degrees Celsius last summer. And that means a lot of things. What about the, the, the health and the heat? What is your perception of that uh, special point? 
Well, of course, the, the uh, rising temperatures and these days of extreme heat are a terrible threat to our patients. But what is the role of digestive disease professionals in this? After all, we're taking care of ulcers and polyps and abnormal liver tests. So where, where does heat, where does heat come in this picture? And it, it, I think it does in two ways. You know, we can play a role to to be aware of those patients who were gravely at risk by understanding perhaps that they are economically disadvantaged, come from substandard housing, and ask some questions like, are you prepared for the hot day? Where are you gonna go when the power goes out or your air conditioning fails? So having an awareness of who our patients are and who might be at risk for extreme heat. And although we don't often have time to do this in our, in our office pr procedure rooms, or in our exam room, so how about in that waiting room? How about putting some resources in the waiting room that our patients can, can take home to be aware of the extreme heat problem? And there are many resources available. MyGreenDoctor.org has free resources in several languages. Uh, so does Healthcare Without Harm. And many of our other societies are beginning to develop these for our members to give to their patients through the waiting room. So the ways we can get engaged, even if we don't have time in the actual procedure room, Okay, so if I, I don't know if there are uh, some questions on the panel. Yeah, there's a question here um, uh, from uh, Carlos uh, Weida from Chile. It says, the, my question is the quality in endoscopy indicate many points like oxygen supply with disposable material. How will possible uh, do the, how can we do the best without affecting the environment? Uh, what's the balance? How does uh, one uh, put on one side the environment, of course, and most importantly, of course, uh, uh, delivering the best uh, care to our patients. So who wants to take this on first? Uh, maybe uh, Todd? And okay. Then, and then uh, so at least in the United States, there's a great movement towards throwing everything away. Many of our endoscopy centers don't even have reusable biopsy forceps or other devices. And so we now need to think among ourselves and start to ask the suppliers to give us again reusable equipment that we can clean and ask our endoscopy center leaders to let us have reusable equipment and to clean it after use. Um, and then to ask our societies to go to the vendors themselves, the manufacturers, and explain that our members now want to have reusable items and not have to throw everything away. It's time to change the standard of care back to maybe how it was 10 years ago in a much more sustainable fashion. But this is for leadership and, and each of us needs to play a role to, to make those demands. Thank you, Todd. So, Lee, from in, in your unit, uh, uh, you, you sound like you have daily sort of uh, plans in terms of how you're going to proceed uh, with the endoscopy list for the day. Do these questions come up sometimes, even from patients? Uh, you're, you're, you know, you're thinking so much about the environment and climate change. What about me? Yeah, we don't often get um, the questions um, from patients, but I completely agree with what um, Todd says. We need to go back to the suppliers and industry and say, you know, we want to really re reuse the equipment we don't want to have to discard it anymore and it's up to them to help us um to make that you know that dream sort of a reality um i remember uh, um as i started many years ago as an endoscopy nurse we reused everything um you know everything was cleaned and you know everything was was used again and you know without without real issue and it is probably time we turned the clock back um we need to think about every aspect of, of what we do um, because there is so much waste and things like oxygen tubing and or all the other things and the suction receptacles. We need to discuss with our um, infection control teams. We need support from those other teams to see what we actually can do because in the UK, there's still quite a lot of confusion about what can be thrown away, what has to be kept, what can be cleaned, what can't be cleaned. So we need that consistency as well. And I think that's probably one of the big issues. Thank you, Professor Downley. Um, now, um, here's a question also to you, uh, also, um, Dr. Downley. Uh, you mentioned in your talk factoring uh, in a, a frailty score. Uh, the question is, uh, could you speak uh, to that just a bit more? 
Yeah, so it's really, it's all, all around uh, making sure the right patient gets the right procedure um, rather than, than those, those wasteful procedures. Um, frailty scores are often used widely with, within the NHS in the UK just to assess the patient's suitability for procedures, but also um, recovery periods and fitness for further intervention as well. So it's about making sure that we, we carefully assess the patient making sure that the, the, uh, an endoscopic procedure is the right procedure for them, or can we offer a less invasive alternative? And of course that has implications for patient safety, but also has the implications for um, the climate change as, as well. Um, and I think we do need to, to look at those a little bit more than we'll probably do now. And that also relates, uh, relates to um, more specialist triage as well, making sure we're doing the right procedures for the right patients. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Rocky, there's a couple of questions uh, here uh, I'd like to ask uh, our uh, speakers. Uh, one is, uh, it says, uh, reuse, reduce, and recycle. How can, how can we realistically achieve these three in endoscopy? I think there's been uh, several suggestions there. Some, of course, are more challenging than others, but uh, maybe um, um, our speakers can take this on. Would you like to start, Lee, and then we'll go to Todd? answer this question yep so so how to reduce reuse and recycle um yeah it sounds difficult initially but endoscopy really lends itself rather well to this um and i think the first thing we need to do is is look at waste segregation and um, the amount of packaging that all wear endoscopy equipment and accessories come in is absolutely huge um, the packaging can be easily recycled. Um, we need to think about um, the amount of waste that goes into clinical waste. There's probably very little that actually needs to truly be in clinical waste and the rest can go into domestic waste. So things like uh, lubrication, jelly tubes and things like that, they absolutely don't need to go into um, clinical waste at all. They can go into to domestic waste. Um, you know, uh, sterile water bottles can be recycled, plastic ampoules, um, they can all be recycled. So there is quite a lot that can go in there. We also as well are starting to recycle wear accessories. So anything with hard plastic and metal, for example, like a, a forcep or a guide wire, they can be recycled as well in special uh, recycling bins. So there, there is a lot that we can um, move forward with. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sack, any additional comments to addition to what Dr. Donnelly had uh, mentioned? Well, I, I would. It's, it's time to now rethink the standards of practice for many of the things we do and ask whether they're really necessary. I would turn the example to our colleagues in the ophthalmology world in India who reuse, who, who don't change gowns every time they walk into a procedure and they, they reuse gloves. Uh, they found that the infectious rates in the operating room are just the same as in the United States where everything is thrown away after each use. I think that's probably true in gastroenterology too. We can reuse the sheets on the beds instead of throwing them away. We can reuse some of our own gowns. We may not need to put uh, protection on our heads and masks on for every procedure we do as I see in the United States these days that we didn't do 20 years ago. Uh, and we had talked about even some biodegradable products. If we have to use paper products or we use gloves, let them all be biodegradable. The, the things that we can start to do that will add up over time. If you look in most uh, inpatient units, the gastroenterology department is the third most wasteful department, sometimes the second most wasteful in the, in the whole hospital. Uh, we can do better. I know we can do better. Okay. I would like to tell you a joke in, in Spanish countries. Uh, the packaging says use once, and in Spanish, once is 11 times. <laughs> we'll, we'll have to remember that. So we're coming close to the hour, but I think we do have a few more questions. So I, I, I know our two uh, distinguished speakers have agreed to stay on for five extra minutes. So we'll just ask a couple more questions. Thank you so much uh, for willing to do so. Um, so, uh, uh, Todd, you uh, thank you for the discount code uh, MGDWGO. So that means I assume it's actually anyone can sign up to your My Green Doctor. It's actually at no cost. So, can endoscopy units sign up, or can a can a nurse in a unit sign up, uh, 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 or is it really for physicians? Ha, ha, or you don't really make any distinction whatsoever. So, so, so MyGreenDoctor.org or .es in Spanish 
works in any outpatient facility, an office, a clinic, an endoscopy center, an imaging center, and anyone working in the facility can use that discount code. So the nurse, the manager, the technician, I really encourage people to offer that code to their practice or their office or their endoscopy center manager. Because honestly, it's the managers who do most of this kind of work. Uh, we nurses and doctors, we're busy taking care of patients. But if we can get the manager to agree that sustainability will be something that this practice, this office, this department is gonna do to make it part of the code, part of the, part of the, the dedication of the unit, as important as giving great health care or respecting patients' privacy or respecting everyone in the office, let sustainability be something that the managers agree that we something we do. So give that discount code to your manager, register yourself. Yes, nurses, doctors, technicians, uh, it's free. They'll, the office will save hundreds of dollars, often thousands of dollars each year by embracing sustainability and My Green Doctor is one of the programs you can use. Thank you, Dr. But it's Sp free. Speaking of savings, uh, Dr. Donnelly, uh, has your unit actually measured, uh, I mean, it sounds like you really have done a, a lot. And in fact, uh, it was really quite impressive looking at the website of your health system. Uh, you've, you started sustainability back in 2007. It was a renewed effort and I, I saw in 2021. But I was sort of wondering, you know, in terms of audits and so on, have you actually measured the cost savings while maintaining uh, optimal uh, patient uh, care and, and delivery of care? Yes, uh, we have. We've got we've got lots of audits that are ongoing at the moment. Um, one of the most difficult things that we we're trying to, to do at the minute is audit where um, reduction in waste, uh, clinical waste usage. Um, and I don't have the figures for that at the moment, but uh, we think we've reduced our clinical waste by about a third coming out of endoscopy by actually just um, good waste segregation. So by moving to uh, domestic waste and, and recycling. So that, that's, that's had a significant input, impact, um, both sort of financially and also on the, um, uh, the, the environment. Um, but one of the other things we're looking at into is actually is where uh, sterile water use as well, um, which is again is a, is a huge um, resource for endoscopy. And um, we're, we're looking to um, stop using sterile water for manual flush. And we think that's going to actually have a big impact as well. Great. So yes, we have made some, some audits and significant changes. And uh, thank, thank you very much. Just a, a couple more minutes. Uh, maybe uh, this is for our moderator, um, uh, Dr. Sands, in your unit in Chile, for example, uh, what kinds of measures, practical tips uh, and brief that you can give uh, to uh, members of our audience who might consider the kinds of changes that you have implemented in your unit? The first thing, is, I think it's important to follow the guidelines. Uh, because uh, I, I am absolutely agree with that uh, sentence that the, the uh, endoscopy, which is not needed, is uh, waste. And um, the other thing is uh, to avoid energy, energy dispenses and uh, to uh, also to go further with, uh, for instance, CO2 that we are spending all the time the flush of CO2, and that's not necessary for the whole procedure. And um, the sterile water is also another issue that we are tackling. And the waste procedures, uh, with the waste processing, it's uh, quite important. This clinic, this uh, hospital, has a group of uh, the whole clinic is engaged in, in climate change. So the, the energy searches of the clinic itself has been changing. And this, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, ideas and uh, actions that move in that uh, sense of avoiding the uh, carbon footprint. And uh, the committee devoted to that is important, but uh, I think that the patients themselves and all the, the team working, it should be engaged and motivated for avoiding the climate change. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Sands. So just to close, maybe Jim, we can show the uh, uh, what's coming up uh, in two weeks, the next talk. Uh, I'd like to close also with uh, two quotes from our uh, distinguished uh, speakers. Uh, one is uh, by Dr. Sack, and that's the discount code. Uh, it's not a quote, it's a code, MGDWGO. 
he, uh, he mentioned that to us. And also I, I liked really one um, um, kind of takeaway message from uh, Dr. Donnelly and that's small changes, big impact. I think each one of us can really, what, uh, small things add up in a huge way. So uh, thank you both for just fantastic presentations. Uh, if we can keep the slide up, uh, I just wanna briefly let the audience know about the next uh, session. I don't know, Jim, if you could do that. Uh, so uh, the next session, that's session uh, number eight, we have, uh, we're going to be touching on a hugely important uh, aspect, and that's pediatric health, and also going to be talking about uh, trainees and early, early career providers. This is really our future uh, in terms of who will be uh, kind of will be passing on the baton to, and they're, they're already doing a, a lot. So th this, uh, this is really going to be also another uh, fan, uh, fantastic session. Uh, also, to close, I want to give a shout out to WGO, 65 years and, and counting. We're doing a fantastic job taking the lead uh, effort vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, climate uh, change. Thank you so much to everyone, every member of the participants. Thank you, Professor uh, uh, Donnelly, uh, Dr. Sack, and, and also uh, Professor Sands for, uh, for moderating the session. And look forward to seeing everybody in, uh, in two weeks. Be well. Take care.